Hello there. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and I'm delighted to be joined shortly by Dr. Matt Walsh in this episode of Our Brighter Future to talk about the work that he is doing in communities of well-being. And I also wish to uh, note that uh, Matt is one of my personal encounters that will be featured in my new book, Leading Beyond Sustainability, to be published next year, 2024. So um, just saying a little bit about this brighter future, it's uh, a future that is defined by six aspirations. And the six aspirations you can see on the screen there are, first of all, connection, which is the physical connection of things like the internet and social media, uh, emails, getting together at conferences, as well as the emotional side of connection, such as compassion, love and kindness. The second aspiration there is peace, which I define as no war and declining levels of violence throughout the world. Uh, vitality, which is the health and well-being of people, communities, all of life and indeed the planet on which we live. Uh, abundance is abundance of food, water, energy, services, wealth, indeed anything that we need to lead our best life. And opportunity is opportunity for learning, growth and contribution. And wisdom, the final aspiration, is our ability to do the right thing the right way at the right time. So those are the six aspirations. And today I'd like to look at just one of them, which is the joy of vitality, which you'll remember is about us as humans, communities, all of life and the planet on which we live. And it gives me great pleasure. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, actually introduce you to a dear friend, Dr. Matt Walsh. Hi, Matt. Hello, Clive. It's really nice to be speaking to you again. It's always nice to be speaking with you. And just so that people know, um, from my side, I had the joy of meeting Matt I think it was at the beginning of the pandemic during lockdown um, a mutual friend brought the two of us together and we've shared many journeys uh, since then but Matt today it's uh, it's uh, an opportunity for you to just tell us a little bit about what you do and how that is uh, accelerating the joy of vitality in the world well I'm, I'm... I wonder I wonder whether I'm making a contribution in that space, to be really honest, Clive. But I'll I'll tell you a bit about how I'm spending my um my time at the moment. I'll send it to, I'll say a little bit about uh, where I've come from as well, if um if that's all right, because it might it might make uh, a bit more sense. So uh, a, a lifetime in the National Health Service as a as a doctor and a uh, leader uh, in uh, organisations, mainly in West Yorkshire uh, in the UK. Um, uh, really proud of um, my life in service in the NHS. Um, and uh, I guess about three years ago, stepped out into the uh, into the wide world um, and um, Took, took quite a quite a while to orientate myself to be honest and Clive you really helped me with that and um, reminded me uh, about the importance of focusing on purpose and refinding the energy to be purposeful was um, part of my struggle around the time I was um, I, I first met you um, I, I, ever in your debt um, so where did I go with my purpose? How did I find it? My purpose to help people who were traveling the same sort of journey that I traveled in my professional life and to create spaces for them to think about um, their purpose and why they do the work that they do. And along the way to um, to celebrate what's great and to 
talk about what needs to change, to talk about what needs to change. Um, if we're to respond to those six challenges and questions that I think you're asking, I think one of the things that I realised uh, early in my encounter with you, Clive, was that um, the sustainable development goals, those 17 sustainable development goals that the world has agreed are important things, they are for me. They are for me. They are for me to engage with, not just governments to engage with. They are for us to engage with. And that felt like a revelation to me. I spent my life in leadership thinking that my purpose was around the health one of those. Um, but actually, I now know that it's about all of them. It's about all of them. And, uh, and that feels both challenging and inspiring. Um, so, uh, so how am I spending my time now? I do a lot of work with um, uh, people who are wondering whether being a director in the National Health Service might be something that uh, might enable them to be who they need to be. Um, and so uh, various programmes of clinical leadership development and um, uh, leadership development across disciplines, um, uh, uh, working largely with people working in hospital environments, but uh, also beginning to link to uh, the emerging systems that are uh, that have been established. So uh, spending time working, delivering modules and delivering learning opportunities and learning sets and um, finding two things. Um, people who are at once um, completely overwhelmed by the challenges of doing what feel like impossible jobs um, and being inspired by their courage and their commitment and their certainty that we can make things better. And so I find myself in that really privileged really privileged role of being able to hold space so that people have got a protected time to think more carefully than they are able to in the thick of it uh, about why we're really here and what's the difference that we really want to make and that is a really beautiful thing I feel if I'm being honest for the first time in my professional life that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and uh, and finding a, a, a real appetite, a real appetite for a conversation about how we reconnect to our humanity in our work in the health service. And it, it might sound strange to talk in those terms. The health service surely is a business that is about humanity. Uh, and yet, because of the degree of pressure and challenge and strain and stress in the system, it sometimes feels for the, person, for the people working in it and for the people who are being served by it, that we've lost our connection to that. And so creating a space where we can think about that and find ways of reminding ourselves that this is about love. This, this business is at its most fundamental about love. And why don't we start from there and see what happens? And beautiful things keep happening in those spaces. Um, it's really inspiring. So, so I'm spending some of my time there and then some of my time, uh, and again, really engaged in the relationship between creativity and health and well-being and uh, the relationship between creative practice art music literature poetry and the business of delivering health care and i suppose where i've got to in my framing of that is that the nhs is good most of the time at diagnosing what the matter might be and good some of the time at putting that right but what the NHS really struggles with is the idea of healing, healing. And that's where creative practice 
helps because that's what creative practice is about. Creative practice is about my relationship with myself, with others around me and with the world. And so what I'm really interested in is what might happen if we brought those two worlds together and had a conversation about how we can help each other. And that's really inspiring to be part of. Mm. Well, that's so powerful, Matt. And uh, and it's great to hear the work that you're doing with leaders in the health profession. And, uh, and I also know that um, a lot of your work is also about the communities um, that the health profession serves. And exactly as you described just now, how um, helping people to find themselves and express themselves and be together um, as communities and as groups of people mm. to do things also helps their well-being, which mm. in practical terms, I guess, in terms of health service, it reduces the the, the the pressure of the health service because people are not as poorly. Do you want yeah. to say a little bit about that? Well, definitely, yeah. So, uh, so I, 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 I talk about this a lot in the um, in the module that I um, that I deliver um, in the Shadow Board program that I'm that I'm part of. So, there's a map that I that I show. Um, everywhere I go um, and it's a journey it's a journey from and you can draw this map uh, for any city or any place in the world actually um, mm. uh, and so this journey goes from uh, what you might describe as the leafy suburbs into the center of the city and the place that I know best of all is Bradford because I spent most of my uh, career as a doctor in in um, in Bradford and so this map shows this journey and it's a journey of um, years of healthy life uh, for uh, for a man in Bradford. And if you uh, are brought up uh, and live in the leafy suburbs of um, Ilkley, then you will likely benefit from 70 or 71 years of active, healthy and independent life. If you happen to be born and brought up and live in the centre of Bradford, then you will benefit from somewhere in the region of 55 to 56 years of healthy, independent life. There's a 14 year differential depending on where you happen to live in Bradford and you can uh, and the same the same um, uh, situation exists wherever you choose to look at wherever you choose to look at uh, here and internationally there is a huge um, differential in people's uh, healthy life expectancy depending on where you happen to have been born and brought up and live um, and 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 I'm ashamed to say that that has got no better um, as a consequence of my passion and my commitment to addressing inequalities it's something that's fired me all of my professional life is the knowledge that there are huge inequalities in people's experience of health and health care and that has not got better as a consequence of all the work and all the effort that I've put in. That's no, really interesting, uh, Matt. Sorry to mm, interrupt you, yeah, there, yeah. but uh, that's speaking a number of things to me. Mm. I mean, that's a powerful statistic. Mm. And I'm guessing that although there's, was it 14 years difference yeah, in those yeah. metrics, that although there may be 14 years difference, that's probably not meaning that. Um, the man you you mentioned a man yeah. <laughs> uh, in the centre of Bradford probably doesn't mean that they live fourteen years less. It's just that they don't have that good health for that duration, which I assume also means that during their life, perhaps shorter though it may be, but they probably spend more time at the door of the NHS 
than the person you described in the leafy suburbs. That was the first thing that struck me. Do you want to say a bit about that? <laughs> well, yeah. I, so this is very complicated territory, and um, mm. and I and I won't pretend to be an expert in in it. But I, I'll say two things in response to that, Clive. The first is uh, you're right that I'm talking about healthy life expectancy, but the same differential exists if you're looking at the hard edge of mortality. You know, so the yeah. same the same uh, inequality exists there and it's absolutely clear that there is more need in those communities where healthy life expectancy is lower than yes. in other communities whether that then translates into nhs activity is a really interesting and troubling question uh, it's a really interesting and troubling question because access to healthcare doesn't just operate as a function of need. It's much more complicated than that. And there are ways of demonstrating that actually the opposite is the case, that people who are living in those areas where they are benefiting from more healthier life and a longer life actually also benefit from easier access to services. Wow. So the deck is stacked mm. against the people who live in those poorer communities. And that's something that we really are attending to. We really are beginning to attend to in a much more meaningful way as a consequence of some of the changes that have happened recently in the architecture of the NHS, bringing systems together hospitals, community services, local authorities, education, housing, the police, the fire service, now beginning, beginning to have a different conversation about what our common purpose might be here. Yes, yes, that that is very powerful. First of all, thank you, because I, I didn't realise that data, mm. but it makes sense. I guess the people who find it easier to get to the doctor. And that could be for all sorts of reasons. I, I assume it. some people's jobs um, give them time to get to the doctor and other yeah. people who may be struggling in different ways might find it difficult to get to the doctor just because they're trying to earn a living or feed yeah. their families. There's all sorts of things that play out into that system. The other thing that uh, is um, in my mind from what you've said is Thank goodness for people like you and others working in this space, because uh, one of the things that uh, I, I, I wish to uh, draw out in the book is the fact that, uh, you know, sometimes we despair about the state of the world. And yet uh, the more I do this work, the more I discover that uh, actually in so many ways things are improving, as you say, People are beginning to look at this, beginning to join the dots, to join the services, to make the connection between community life and health needs and and so on. Um, mm. Do you want to say a little bit about some of the practical things that have arisen out of that discourse and collaboration between the services and maybe things that have actually hit the ground right in the middle of a community that have made a difference? Yeah, so um, it's probably two, three years ago. No, two years ago, I was um, working with colleagues in in Bradford um, in quite an intense piece of work to establish um, the way that they were going to begin to collaborate around this common purpose that I was talking about. This um, the, the the working together on the wider determinants of health. Um, um, understanding that the NHS. Um, so I talked earlier about my sense of guilt and responsibility that I wasn't able to change the world, but but I know that in my role in the NHS, I was only touching a person's life for a very short space of time. And uh, actually, there was much more going on in their lives and in their worlds and around them that was contributing to their sense of connection, community and well-being. Um, 
So, um, so yeah, so beginning to bring people together around that agenda, creating a space, convening a space and holding that space to enable people to begin to have a conversation about well, what might we do, what might we do on uh, on this agenda. And a particular, it's, it's, again, it's one of these things that never, ever is finished. It's never, ever mm -hmm. finished. So diabetes diabetes and I can remember one of my first experiences of a conversation about leadership and change in Bradford going back 25 years was about how do we get on top of diabetes if there's a ticking time bomb and if we don't organize ourselves then we're going to be completely overwhelmed uh, by this tidal wave of diabetes and there's still even though loads of work has been done to change the way that diabetes is delivered in Bradford um, really kind of revolutionary shifting care from a hospital setting into a community setting. Um, there's still this ticking time bomb because we've not quite got to those people who can't connect, who can't connect. For whatever reason, they can't connect to services the way they are currently configured. And so beginning to ask the question, uh, well, maybe we need to reach out to them differently. Maybe if they can't respond, maybe we need to change our approach and beginning to open up the possibility of us being different, actually, us being different. The system is perfectly designed to deliver the results that it gets. If we want different results, we need to change the system. And so beginning to think there's some really great work going on now in Bradford that is none of my responsibility at all. This has been taken on by colleagues in Bradford. The only thing I ever did was convene and hold a space and now they're beginning to think about so how would we reshape this so that we get to people before they've got diabetes pre-diabetes how do we get to people before they've de de developed the disease and get in there and help them to manage their diet their lifestyle their approach to exercise all of that the choices that they might make how might we help them to begin to make different choices and that that work is beginning to bear fruit. I can't give you the data and the evidence yet, Clive, because this is kind of a long game. But at least I think there's a clear understanding that actually we can't expect them to change. We need to change. We mm -hmm. need to reshape the way that we're approaching this to enable people to benefit in a better way. Does that does that answer the question? Yes, it does. And I know that, um, I mean, that's powerful. And I look forward to seeing that data as it emerges. Mm. And uh, and I know in the past you've spoken to me about how doing things that are seemingly unrelated to health, like building community spaces for, for the arts, music, painting, yeah. poetry. Yeah. And I know you're a poet as well, yeah. um, because yeah. we've we've had those conversations but that those things in some way contribute to better health. What's what's the relationship there? Well, again, so I'll, I'll take you back to the um, the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance work that I'm that I'm part of now, and I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a little a little story, um, which explains my relationship to that to that work. So my mum uh, was in a care home uh, before she died a couple of years ago, and um, it was during uh, lockdown. And I was the uh, I've got three sisters, uh, so there's four of us, but I was the named visitor. I was uh, the only one that uh, could visit my mum and could only see her once a week for uh, for a while. And it was really dreadful. It was really, really dreadful, really awful time for everybody. Um, but it was also a really beautiful time. It was a really beautiful time for me because I was able to stay connected to my mum. And this one day I went in and she was um, unhappy and lonely and um, and didn't really know me for a little while. And um, and I sat down beside her and I'd uh, on the way over to seeing her, I'd heard this really beautiful piece of music that I knew that she knew. Um, and so I sat 
down beside her and I got my phone out and I started to play this piece of music and she looked at me, she listened to the music, she looked at me, she took my hand and she walked me out of her room and into the corridor and she danced me down the corridor and back up again. And um, and the nurses looked at her and me and said, that is amazing. That is amazing. We didn't think that she would ever be able to do that. Um, so it changed their relationship with my mum and it reminded my mum about who she was and it reminded her about who I am. That feels like a really powerful demonstration of the power of creativity, the power of art and music and poetry and literature to keep us connected to who we really are. Um, and so this work in that space where we have demonstrated to everybody's satisfaction now that there is a value in investing in creativity and in creating a relationship between creative practice mm. and health and care practice because that space that space is about humanity that space is about healing that space is about keeping us connected to ourselves to each other and to the world and that feels fundamental to our humanity fundamental to our humanity can i tell you a story yeah do. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned bradford I don't know mm. if I've told you this story ever before, Matt, but mm. uh, I did my master's degree in um, safety and reliability at the University of Bradford. Mm -hmm. And uh, my uh, main tutor was Professor Dr. Alf Keller. And uh, Alf Keller was a wonderful man. He may still be a wonderful man. I don't know whether he's still with us, which is an awful thing to say. I hope he is. Um, but he was quite elderly when I was doing this, and this was back in the 90s. <laughs> and um, I can remember him one occasion in a in a little classroom in Bradford somewhere. Um, Alf got a piece of chalk out, proper chalk on a proper blackboard, and wrote this formula on the blackboard. And it was it was a a real mathematician was uh, um, Alf Keller. Mm -hmm. And he, he wrote this formula out and he said to me, do you know what that means, Clive? And I said, I haven't got a clue, but I've got a feeling you're going to tell me. He said, yes, let me tell you what it means. And I've no idea what the formula was. I couldn't, couldn't redraw it or rewrite it at all. He said, what it means is whatever you invest in up front in maintenance and prevention, you will reap tenfold by not having to fix it when it goes wrong. Yeah, that's that's what he said. I said, and he said, I don't know why um, the um, the factor is ten. He said, but mm -hmm. pretty well, that's how it plays out. So whether it's the time you spend servicing your car so it doesn't break down, or the uh, the time you invest in a relationship so that you don't have to deal with the fallout of that. Mm. or whether it's the time that you invest in wellness and well-being and communities and then you don't have to um, spend out as much on um, uh, on the NHS. Yeah. And I just wonder whether in your experience that holds true. So, for example, uh, and I'm, I'm guessing it's quite hard to join the dots, but maybe you might tell me otherwise, but if we put on an art exhibition <laughs> in um, in some um, suburb of Bradford, where it was it was good to bring people together, get them out of their loneliness, if that's what they were experiencing. But it, but but just to have conversations with each other and with whoever else happened to be around. But if we invested in community art and things like that. Would it would it have that effect of reducing the demand 
uh, in the health service. So there was a uh, there was a really fantastic piece of work done by the all party parliamentary um, uh, uh, group in I think 2017, a publication called Creative Health, where they uh, drew together all of the evidence that there is to help us to um, to help us to believe the truth in that, Clive. And mm. and so there is absolutely no doubt, there is absolutely no doubt that an investment in the relationship between creativity and health will will bear dividends. Um, it's absolutely clear what needs to change is our faith in the evidence. Yes. Uh, what needs to change is that we need to develop the courage to make long term investments rather than continuing to focus on short term. Um, I'll call it performance, um, mm. but it might not be even performance, a, a, a version of performance that actually might not matter as much as the humanity of all of this. Um, so the evidence is absolutely clear and codified in the APPG report in 2017 and the work of the um, Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance that I'm co-chair of is to support systems, places, people who want to take that evidence and bring it into the conversation in their place and, mm. um, and begin to change the way that money flows. Um, because at the end of the day, this this needs investment. But there was a really great piece of work um, published by, I think, the Health Foundation uh, this year, which uh, which uh, again um, reinforces the the view of your professor, whose name I've forgotten, Alf Keller. Alf Keller. So so uh, and and they will say that every pound that you invest in primary and community services in healthcare, every pound that you invest in primary and community will generate an economic benefit to the place, yes. not to the health service, but no. to the place of 16 to 20 pounds. Every pound you invest in primary care will generate an economic benefit of 16 to 20 fold that investment. Nobody needs to write a business case about that. We just need to start believing it. Yes. So. To what extent, because clearly some of that is happening, mm. um, thanks to your work and the work of others like you, Matt. And um, so to what extent is that happening? And to what extent do you have hope that it will happen more in the time to come? And let me add a third question uh, in on that, because as you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, is this something that artificial intelligence can help us with? To, uh, to assemble the overwhelming business case, because I would imagine, I'm not an expert on artificial intelligence, Matt, but I would imagine if you asked artificial intelligence to write a balanced business case for that level of investment, um, that it would do it. And, and I also, um, picking up on your lead about the 16-fold return yeah. in certain aspects, the other thing which I'm learning again through the, the work into the book Leading Beyond Sustainability is that our impact is always far exceeding, far exceeding that that we can measure. You know, the, the, the people I've talked with that are, that are making the world a brighter place very rarely take full account of the impact that they're having. I had a conversation, it's on my YouTube channel with Olga Rack, who um uh, was in the watchmaking industry in Switzerland and then moved um, following a conversation that she and I had four or five years ago. She moved into local government and politics and uh, she was talking actually uh, very, very keen on environmental impact and she was talking about um, some of the things that she did and she said oh and by the way these aren't her exact words but this is the the essence by the way I also moved house and into an eco home to cut down on my um, carbon footprint. She said, of course, that's only impacting me. I said, Olga, it won't be, you know, 
you're thinking of your friends that have visited you in that house, that have seen you make that transition and how and, and how you will have inspired them. And you won't know. This is the point. You won't know the true benefit, the true impact in a positive way on the world that you've made. Wow. So <laughs> conscious, I said a lot in that little discourse, Matt, but um, <laughs> yeah, there, there are some questions about um, how do we account for it? Are people accounting for it? And do you have hope that this will happen in a big way? So, um, right. So I'll tell you about the conversation I had this morning with a group of um, with a group of senior people in the NHS in the northwest. Um, and and this this would be my experience wherever I'm going. Uh, but this was a particularly powerful uh, conversation. Um, I, I was blown away by their willingness to inhabit this space. Um, I was blown away by their courage, uh, their sense of the possibility of something different and better, their understanding that the system's perfectly designed to deliver the results that we're getting. So if we want the results to be different, we need to change the system. And that's about relationships. So I think there's a generation of leaders uh, and I, 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 the caveat to this, but I think there's a generation of leaders who actually see that they have agency and could do things differently and could lead the system in a different way and in a different direction. So I'm full of hope that there is a leadership capacity and capability to do this. Um, I'm also full of hope that the generations that are following me see the world differently to the mm. way that my generation saw it. Um, and I'm inspired. I'm inspired by the different choices that my children have made about the way that they want to live their lives and the choices that they make in that. And they have changed me. They've changed me. Um, so I'm full of hope that we can do this and inspired by the possibility of being part of a conversation about it. And I love being able to convene spaces where people can talk about this. Um, what I'm wondering about, so so there's a the caveat is, but I was just like that too. Um, so what happens to us? What happens to us when we assume accountability? And how do we help people to be courageous enough not to be like we thought we had to be? And there's a great leadership development challenge in the middle of that that I'm loving being part of. Um, yeah, don't make the same mistakes that I made kind of thing. Um, how much is it happening? It's happening everywhere, and it, but it's happening in pockets. It's happening in pockets because of enthusiasts and um and i think that might be the right way um I, and the reason i say that is because it might be back to the previous point as soon as the system decides we're going to do this the system starts to decide that it's going to govern it and when the system starts to govern it we go back to the status quo so i wonder mm. whether actually what needs to happen here is it's a thousand flowers blooming uh, <laughs> and our job sometimes our job might be to get out of the way of that uh, uh, or convene the space and let it happen rather than try and control it because <laughs> i think the energy and the ambition and the courage to be different is there i love i love these conversations matt and um you know, you you remind me of another personal encounter that is in the book with a, a man. I may have mentioned him to you before, a man called Lawayo Biswick. It's a great mm. name mm. in Malawi. And uh, uh, Biswick features in the book for his work in permaculture. And mm. without going into too much detail, I remember one conversation with Biswick and uh, uh, I'd been talking to him about forests and the power for um mitigating climate change and and then a, a few months or maybe a couple of years later 
I'm on another call with Biswick and Biswick says, oh, and by the way, I've grown a forest. And I oh. and I said, really? I said, have you been out planting trees? He said, no. He said, in Malawi, which is where he lives. Yeah. He said, to grow a forest, all you need to do is protect the land. The yeah. forest will grow. Yeah. You don't need to plant a single tree. Yeah. The forest will grow, which is. Yeah. To your oh, point. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. And it's so true, I think. It's so true. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Really powerful. It's a really powerful story. So it reminds me of this conversation that's going on about rewilding in Scotland. At, at oh, the yes. And, you know, do we plant? Do we? It's, the, it's exactly the point. Do we plant or do we just let it? Just let, let it, it be because it will happen. Yeah. And it and yeah. it's it's a mix of both. There are there are so many stories mm. on those subjects in in my book. Uh, I've got uh, Dan Khan, who uh, is of the Wood Meadow Trust and works with Wood, wood, Meadow, wood Meadows. Mm. Um, I've got uh, uh, people working for the Environment Bank and uh, um, net gains in habitat and all sorts mm. of things. There's, there's so many amazing people that I've had a, the the privilege of a conversation with Matt, and mm. and I know you and I could keep talking yeah. for so long, but if we put a three hour video on YouTube, um, people would look at it and think I haven't got time for that. No. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for this time together. I know we'll have more opportunities to talk. They won't all be recorded the way this is, but uh, I tre treasure them immensely. And uh, on behalf of humanity, I really honestly thank you for everything you're doing to make this world a better place. Is there anything you'd like to say in conclusion of this uh, encounter? No, only to thank you again, Clive. And um, thanks for welcoming me into your world. And um and and helping me to find my way so um so thank you and it's been it's been really great talking with you this afternoon i've really enjoyed this space thank you so much matt